Hello everyone. We've got some early to mid 2000s systems to explore. The arrival of the new millennium meant it was time to shake up the beige world with some futuristic two-tone cases. We even got a set of twins here. Just look at how futuristic they are. All right, well, let's tear into these. First up is this system made by Medion. Medion is a German consumer electronics company, and these are affectionately known as the Aldi PCs. Aldi is a line of grocery stores also from Germany. Yeah, it's pretty funny to think about a grocery store selling PCs. And interestingly enough, they actually still do. Medion still exists, although they were acquired in 2011 by Lenovo. So while you're picking up the eggs, milk, and bananas, why not grab a PC? <laughs> that just seems like the most Aldi thing in the world. If you've ever been to one, you know what I'm talking about. And we are badged as a Pentium 4, running Windows XP. We also have a BFG sticker there. BFG is a video card manufacturer, and as far as I know, they only produced NVIDIA-based cards. So somebody was doing some gaming in this thing. That Pentium 4 sticker is actually peeling off a little bit. But that's not a big deal. It's not hard to find modern reproductions of those. And this here is actually the power button. It's a very odd one. It's just unnecessarily large. And for some odd reason, has an embossed map of the globe on it. It does look cool though. It's funny they have that giant power button, but they have this teeny tiny reset button. You would need a ballpoint pen or something to hit that. And up top we have some pretty basic looking optical drives. Got a CD burner here and a DVD-ROM here. The quintessential floppy drive, of course. And we have a port cover here. Looks like it slides down. Let's give that a try. Hmm, it's kind of stuck. I don't want to break it. It's probably just fetched up with some dirt in there. Let's try to give it some help. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay, that's got more back there than I thought. Okay, so I was expecting USB and audio, but I was not expecting composite and S video. That's interesting. I wonder how on earth that functions with the upgraded GPU, if it functions at all. We're gonna have to test that out. We also have a Firewire port there. This thing satisfies all your mid-2000s connectivity desires. And this blue plastic is actually translucent. That adds a cool dimension to it. And here's a look around the back. We can see that motherboard has plenty of stuff on board. It's interesting to see two serial ports on a mid-2000s machine. It's nice to see that we have an onboard NIC. This thing was broadband ready. We've got onboard sound here. I'm guessing that's our BFG video card. Got a couple extra USB ports. And that looks like a Firewire slash dial-up modem. That's an interesting combination. I can't wait to check that out. I guess they really wanted to go out of their way to keep that extra expansion slot open. And here's a close look at that label. So this system was actually made in Germany. Well, that's cool. Model number PCMT5. No data manufacturer though. And below that we have a COA sticker for Windows XP Homey Edition. No pro here. And this case has a couple of stickers from Best Buy on it. I don't know if Medion was ever sold by Best Buy. I really can't find a whole lot of info on the Medion Aldi connection. But it kind of seems like that was the only retailer selling these machines, at least in the US. Maybe this thing was just being serviced by Best Buy. And I'm guessing that's a date, November 1st, 2005. We also have another one up top here, dated March 22nd, 2006, assuming that is a date. Maybe somebody who worked at Best Buy at that time period can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, let's get this thing open. Looks like it opens up like any other ATX case. Yeah, not easily, apparently. Wow, there is no place to grab on this cover. It does conveniently have some spots for a flathead screwdriver, though. There we go. Man, that thing was brutal. Wow, we are awfully dusty in here. Although somebody had the forethought to put some silica desiccant packs down there. That's an especially nice touch. These are intended to absorb moisture from humid air. I wonder if Medion did that or if the owner did that. And unfortunately, we are missing the hard drive. Let's go ahead and clear these cables out. I'm gonna have to snip that zip tie. Okay, I see we have our first capacitor plague victim there. I'm not seeing many more though. All the caps around the CPU look okay. And that's usually where we see the most trouble. Okay, let's see what kind of video card we have. Hmm, not easy to tell. It looks like a GeForce 4 or something. Yeah, it looks like maybe an MX4000. Super dusty though. We'll have to get this board cleaned up. And it is nice to see that this board does have AGP. And I'm kind of surprised this is actually a USB card instead of a breakout shield or something. I'm gonna guess based on the crookedness of that screw that this card was added later. And that's a pretty basic PCI USB card. Very useful to have on hand. 
Now let's see about this Firewire dial-up modem thing. It has this cable that runs to the front panel. I'm assuming that's only for the Firewire connectivity. What a weird little card. It's actually branded Medion. I really don't know a whole lot about that company, but I guess they were more than just systems integrators. Nothing much on the back, but that is an interesting way to save on a PCI slot. Just combine Firewire and the dial-up modem, why not? And here's a good shot of those chips if somebody wants to read more into this strange thing. And that motherboard is made by MSI, model MS-6533, version 1, with an SIS-645 Northbridge and an SIS-961 Southbridge. And the onboard NIC is a Realtek RTL8100L. That chip has excellent compatibility, very Linux and Unix friendly. And here's a look at the BIOS and I.O. chips. Okay, let's check out that CPU. Pentium 4 heatsink clips are usually never fun, but these actually look really simple. Ugh. And of course the CPU came with it. I didn't even feel any resistance. Well, unfortunately, we do have some damage to the pins here. Some of these got bent. I'm not sure if I did that. It's entirely possible. I try to pull socket 478 heat sinks up as straight as possible on the off chance that the CPU does stick. Oh well, either way, at least I get to show you my technique for straightening CPU pins. I like to use these syringe nozzles. This is just one that came with some flux. Those work great because they're rigid and hollow. And the closer you can get to the diameter of the pins you're straightening, the better. I'm just gonna start on a random one here. This is unfortunately the smallest syringe that I have, but you get the idea. It's actually easier for me to demonstrate this on a Pentium Pro than that tiny Pentium 4. It's a little easier to get this one on video without a macro lens. Just put the syringe over the pin down to about where the bend starts, and then just bend it back into position. You'll of course have to make a few adjustments along the way. Might as well straighten this one too. This chip has several bent pins. This Pentium Pro was given to me by a dear patron of mine. Thank you so much, sir. I do love my Pentium Pros. And every once in a while, just take a moment to stare down each row of the pins with one of your eyes closed. That way you can see if any are out of line and check each row in both directions. All right, the Pentium 4 is looking better. This thing sure was a challenge to both mine and the camera's eyesight. Okay, now I have to get it unstuck. Let's see if an X-Acto knife blade can do it. If not, I may have to introduce some heat. This thermal compound turns to glue over time. And this stuff is especially terrible. Yeah, I'm gonna have to warm this up. I'm just gonna use the hot air gun on my SMD rework station. Don't go crazy hot because you don't wanna damage anything. You could also use a hair dryer or something. Whatever you use, just be sure to keep the temps down below destruction level. There we go. Yeah, I don't think that stuff qualifies as thermal compound. That seems like straight up glue. Okay, let's see if I can even clean this off. Let's try IPA. Well, that's as clean as that's getting. This stuff is demonic. And now we can finally get some info on that CPU. It's an SL6D7, so a fairly early stepping of the Pentium 4 from around 2002. And now, the moment of truth for our pin straightening. And there we go. No fuss whatsoever. Okay, let's check out that RAM. Got a 512 meg stick of DDR1 there. Let's check out the next one. And this stick is from a different manufacturer, although it has a very similar label. That's very interesting. But that gives us a total of one gigabyte, a very comfortable amount of RAM for this time period. Very good. Okay, let's get that motherboard out and address that sketchy cap. Okay, so that seems to be the only visibly bad cap on the entire board. That doesn't guarantee the rest of them are good, but it's not exactly economically practical to proactively replace them all. So I'm just going to replace the one that's obviously bad. And of course, I'm going to use this desoldering alloy to remove the capacitor. You don't have to use this stuff, but man, it sure makes your life so much easier. So let's get some flux on those. Then we just take the alloy and let it mix in with the regular solder. And what happens is it dilutes the regular solder and lowers its melting temperature. 
Just hit both pins with that and the capacitor just falls right off. It's that easy. Now just take the desoldering wick and clean up that excess. There we go. Now let's get our replacement cap in there. Add some more flux. Can never go wrong with more flux. And solder it down. And snip those leads. And clean up. Done and done. Okay, let's check out that fan, man. Seems like it sounds terrible. But let's give it some power and see what it actually sounds like. Okay, well, there's not too much noise out of the bearing. Just a lot of blade noise. I wonder if it's just off balance from the dust. Let's clean this thing up. Wow, what a mess. Do you think they had some airflow problems? Uh, just a little. Let's get that fan bracket off of there. Let's make a dust mound. Have you checked your house's HVAC filter lately? There, that's better. Now let's bust the dust on the mommy board. Using an anti-static brush, of course. Hey, I just noticed those are Rubicon caps. That's fancy. And hey, that battery still has a little charge. Now let's reinstall that cooler using some thermal compound that's not likely to turn to concrete. All right, let's check those drives. These are awfully tight in there. I guess that's the reason why they were only held in with screws on one side. It's actually not possible to put screws in through the other side. There are no holes and that other side panel is not removable. And the CD burner is made by Mitsumi, model CR-480ATE, manufactured May 2002. And the DVD-ROM is made by LightOn, model LTD-163, also made in May 2002. Let's get that thing wiped off. Yeah, what a mess. And the floppy drive is a Sony MPF920E, manufactured April 2002. It's interesting how close in age all these drives are. Let's see how dirty this thing is inside. Okay, it's not too bad. It definitely needs some love though. Actually, I take that back. It's pretty bad. Let's get that face off. And let's get that button out. I'm having to reach deep in this thing. It is quite messy. Let's of course clean those heads. Hmm, they're pretty dirty. I better go over them a second time. There we go. And of course, let's clean and grease the lead screw. Okay, let's torment that power supply now. It has some pretty decent weight to it. And the weight of a power supply is generally a pretty good indicator of its quality. It just means they've used better transformers, bigger heat sinks, and things like that. It shows that they cared. Now, I'm going to take this power supply apart. However, I must caution against doing so if you don't know exactly what you're doing. These things can give you a pretty good zap even if they've been unplugged for a while. So consider yourself warned. Okay, the quality components are definitely there. They even went as far as to put a ferrite bead on the output cables. However, we do have some corrosion down here. I'm guessing this thing got some moisture intrusion at some point. Also, it looks like it has some of that brown celastic that turns conductive when it gets wet. So I'm not gonna be able to trust this power supply. But let's see what we would have been in for if I tried to fire this thing up without checking. Here we go. Ooh, that was a little scary for a second. Let's go again. Well, it just does nothing. Oh well. Well, good thing it's just a regular old ATX power supply. I've got plenty of those lying around. Into the scrap pile it goes. Okay, we definitely need to clean behind that faceplate. So let's see if I can pull it off without breaking it. It's just held on with clips. So far, so good. All right, one more. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, that definitely needed attention. 
And it turns out that blue translucent part is removable, so I can really deep clean this thing. And I got both of those cleaned up, and now that port cover is doing what it's supposed to do. Very good. Okay, now, let's face it. Oh, and if you're wondering about this black dot on the DVD drive, it had me highly confused as well, especially after watching that cathode ray dude video on the drives with the infrared receivers. But it's actually just a glob of paint, and it's the most fearsome paint I've encountered in my entire life. <laughs> it will not come off, and I don't want to scratch the drive, so we'll just leave it there to confuse future generations. Okay, I've got everything reinstalled. Got a cromulent power supply in there. Let's get a DOS boot disk in there, and see what it does. And posts. Sounds like there's something in that DVD-ROM drive. And the floppy drive works. And this thing just springs to life. Okay, that's weird. This is the disc that I usually use to test IDE CD-ROM drives. It definitely sounded like something was in there. Yep, sure is. A copy of The Sims. <laughs> Sims 2 Apartment Life. I just love the stuff I find in these things. And it's in really good condition, too. Is there anything in the CD burner? Nope. Can't get that lucky, I guess. And I just noticed that the hard drive and power LEDs are swapped. I definitely put them back the way I found them. So that's interesting. Let's get those swapped back around. And by the way, I traced this cable with the yellow connector to those S-Video and Composite ports on the front. So clearly those aren't going to work. So this must have connected to the original GPU that was in this machine. So now I'm interested to know what video card that was. Alright, that's sorted now. And for some reason on this boot the CD driver's loaded fine. No idea why. I changed nothing. But at least they're working now. So now we can do an optical drive literacy test. Let's start with the DVD drive. Now just notice how absolutely filthy it is in there. This thing's gonna have to be deep cleaned. But let's see if it reads that Sims DVD, why not? It does spin up. Okay, so that drive should be our drive. Let's see. Yep. Oh, that's right, DOS can't read these discs. But it definitely sounds like it would. Well, let's insert a disc that it will read. And yeah, that drive works fine. It's just filthy. Okay, let's try the CD burner then. That thing sounds gross. Let's see if we can read a CDR. That's not always a given, being a CD burner, especially at this age. Yeah, it seems like it's struggling. Oh, well, that looks mad. I'm pretty sure we don't have it. Yep. So we either can't read CDRs or it can't read, period. Let's try that regular disc. And that looks like a no. Let's just confirm. Oh, it does read it. I wonder why it made that angry amber light. Yeah, it's doing it again. I guess that's its standby light. Well, that's weird. Ah, yet another CD burner that can't read a CDR. It probably needs an adjustment to the laser voltage. Well, surely the DVD-ROM drive can read a CDR. Let's see. That sounds like a solid maybe. Nope, sure can't. Ah, the good old days of early recordable media. Well, I was able to clean up what I could see in there. I'm in a bit of a time crunch, so... We're not going full teardown on this drive today. That will have to do. Okay, I do want to get this case cleaned up, but for some reason I can't bring myself to damage that Best Buy sticker that's been there for 17 years. That just wouldn't feel right. So we're just gonna very gingerly clean around it. Yeah, that'll do. Gotta preserve that provenance. Alright, that'll do it. You know, I'm starting to get fond of these Pentium 4 systems. They are getting to be that age, and this machine is a fine example of an early one. And I'm curious to hear from anyone who had one of these machines back in the day. Did you actually buy it from Aldi? Were they actually selling it in the store, or did you have to buy it online or through a catalog or something? 
I'm dying to know. Just seems like the most unlikely place to sell a computer. And despite the bad power supply and the mounds of dust, I'm actually really pleased with the condition of this machine. It's all around in pretty nice shape. I'm sure someone out there has fond memories of it. Let's move on to the next system. And now, the first of the twins. Let's see if we can find out why these things are marked Laser 1 and Laser 2. Both of those badges do feel laser cut. So I wonder if this thing was running an engraving machine or something. We have a DVD burner up top, and a regular CD burner below that. Got a floppy drive and an internal zip drive, and that's a ZIP250 drive. I've actually never owned one of those before. I only ever had the standard 100 megabyte ones. And we have some badges down here. See we have an AMD Athlon XP processor. And that just happens to be the first processor I ever bought brand new. And we have something in there made by Asus or Asus. Most likely the motherboard. And I've never seen someone so proud of their Western Digital hard drive to put a sticker on the front of the computer. Hopefully it's still in there. And here's a look at the back. With a pretty standard assortment of ports for the time. Though notably it does have SPDIF output. That's interesting. And we've got some kind of video card there. With S-Video output. And nothing else. This machine must have had a very specific purpose. And this case has provisions for fans in both the side and the top. And those fans have clearly been harvested. Alright, let's get this thing open. Aha! That opens way easier than the Aldi PC. And this thing has obviously been pillaged by the fan goblin. They even got the CPU fan. And they also harvested all our RAM. But hey, at least the hard drive's there. Hopefully it works and we get to explore it. Well, let's see that video card. This AGP port has that sliding release tab. Didn't want to slide very well. Yeah, not clearly marked, but I see a Sapphire sticker there, so definitely an ATI something. Yep, ATI Radeon 7000 with 32 megs of VRAM. And that edge connector could use a once over, but overall very nice. Now let's make sure everything's gravy with that CPU. Some people can be pretty hard on socket 462s. Okay, luckily it looks like someone did right by this one. Usually the lugs are broken off and the edges of the die are crushed. This one just needs a cleanup. Let's go ahead and get it out of there. And all the pins look great. Well, let's get this thing cleaned up. This perished thermal paste is not the easiest stuff in the world to remove. But sometimes it goes easier than others. This is just some IPA on a toothbrush. Yeah, we're gonna have to scrape. Uh, guitar picks. Thousand and one uses. Alright, that's clean enough. Now it's the heatsink's turn. Yeah, it's not getting much cleaner than that. Let's get these drives disconnected. And this case has a very convenient hole for keeping these power supply cables out of your way. Can't beat that. And that motherboard is made by ASUS. Model A7VBX-X. And that battery's pretty dead. Let's get it replaced. Alright, let's get that hard drive out of there. And as promised, it is a Western Digital Caviar. 40 gigabytes of fury. IDE drive, of course. Hopefully it works. They don't have the best reputation. Let's get the rest of these drives out of here. I see we have another system from the Dust Planet. And here's that zip drive, made by iOmega because who else? Let's wipe that off. Okay, I want to get into this thing, but first I have to kill a warranty. No service for us. Now, I do like to clean these up inside, but there's only so much you can do. It's not really possible or wise to try to clean the heads. Those are very similar to hard drive heads, and they're very easy to damage. So it's best to just leave them alone. They also have a little felt pad there that they rub against when they go inside their home. So they're kind of sort of self-cleaning, but the rest we can certainly clean up. Let's get that face off. And that floppy drive is an NEC FD1231H with extra fuzz. Manufactured December 1997. Let's just defuzz that real fast. Man, this system is gross. It just gets fuzzier and fuzzier.
God, what a mess. Okay, well, it's somewhat clean now. After spending an exorbitant amount of time on it, let's clean those heads. And those are filthy as well. Better hit them a second time. All right, that'll do. And you know the rest. And here's that CD burner, made by Samsung, model SW-248, manufactured May 2003. Let's defuzz that. And here's the DVD burner, manufactured by Pioneer, model DVR-111D, manufactured October 2006. So quite a late addition to this system. Let's get that wiped off. Okay, I pulled this power supply for interrogation and... There's something in there. So let's find out what. We won't be needing this. Okay, what was rattling around in there? Oh, it must have been this glue. Yeah, sure was. However, things have gotten awfully hot over here. And that capacitor there looks a little puffy. Yeah, it's all looking kind of clapped out in here. Definitely not using this one. But that's not going to stop me from testing it. Let's see if it explodes. Oh, it's not happy. At all. Why is that fan not turning? That's interesting. The drives are pulsing. Well, it sure is hanging on there. Let's see how it likes a 60 watt headlight. Ooh, it doesn't like that at all. I think that was the end of it. One more time. <laughs> yeah, that's too much for it. Well, I guess it's not gonna fail catastrophically. Boring. I'm having some pretty rotten luck with power supplies this week. Okay, now I have to figure something out about this CPU fan. The fan from a Pentium 3 cooler looks awfully close. So let's see if I can haculate that onto there. Well, it just hits a little, but otherwise, I think it fits almost perfectly. Let's just bump it up a little. There we go. It's not the most secure thing in the world, but honestly, that fits pretty well. That's more than fine for a test. Let's get that thing together. An AMD disguised as an Intel. And for RAM, I've dropped two gigs worth of DDR400 in there. Don't even know if this motherboard supports that, but we're gonna find out today. And it is testing time. I've got our surrogate power supply hanging out the side there. Let's see what this thing does. <laughs> okay, why'd that open? And we are posting. It went straight to the BIOS. <laughs> That's not a good sign. Let's close that silly CD burner. If it stays closed. Huh, <laughs> doesn't stay closed. There we go. It just needed a workout. Okay, so that is a two gigahertz CPU. So I guess 2083 is close enough. Let's try that out. Hey, we're booting. Windows XP. I had a feeling we'd find you here. That hard drive is insanely quiet. I swear I can't remember those being noisier. We do have an awful lot of weird noise. That can't just be my capture device. Wiggling the connector does nothing. All right, Bob, do you have a password? Nope. Oh, we're not genuine. For shame. Who would steal from poor innocent Microsoft? Let's see if I can just ignore this for now. I didn't get a startup sound. Do we have sound? Maybe not. But we got Norton. I feel so safe. Okay, let's see what we have on here. QuickBooks Pro 2012. They were using this thing all the way up to 2012? At least? <laughs> let's see what version of Word that is. Word 2000. That is funny. They were using this all that time. Oh, what does Norton want? Show me four things to get the most out of Norton internet security. I know how to get the most out of Norton internet security by uninstalling it. 
Go away. Clippy, how could you let them do that to me? No wonder this computer's running so slow. Norton's still active on this thing. All right, let's get out of here. What else do we have? What is Star Micronics? Point of sale printer? What was this thing? I'm getting office computer vibes, but and then we have stuff like this. Let's see what's in that Epson folder. More printer software. Ah, and Roxio Easy CD Creator. Let's see what's actually on here. Yep, sure is. How many forevers has it been since I've seen this? We're gonna have to see if that thing can actually still burn a CD. Later though. Let's see if I can figure out the last time this thing was used. The zip drive is shared? That's funny. Let's see, documents should give us an idea. Wow, there's a lot of documents. Let's get some details. Wow, this thing was being used up to 2014? This machine had a pretty long life. Let's see what's on the root of that drive. There's more printer stuff on here than I care to imagine. What's in that shared UPS folder? No idea. Okay, apparently it's a printer driver. Not surprised. Let's see, what's free space looking like on that drive? 11 gigs free. Well, I'm gonna guess due to the presence of Corel Draw 9, this thing was doing some kind of graphics design. Let's open that up. Yeah, it's fully registered. Okay. Let's start testing these drives. Starting with the floppy drive. And it works. And it's delightfully noisy. That is music to my ears. How about the zip drive? Okay, looks like it might work. Yep, sure does. <laughs> you know, I still to this day have not encountered a bad zip drive. What's up with that? Even back in the day during the whole click of death thing. Now let's check out the DVD drive. A little bit dusty in there. And it looks like it works. And it's auto running. Okay, let's not install this right now. Yes, I'm sure. Let's explore that. Just to give it some exercise. Yeah, that drive works fine. Very good. How about the CD burner? Oh, that's stuck. Come on, one more time. There we go. That thing couldn't wait to open up when we first powered the system on. Now it wants to get lazy. Swipe that out. And that drive works. Okay, I loaded the label, but it sounds like it's having some trouble. It's getting real ticky in there. Yeah, I guess that thing's not having a good time. Let's try to explore. Yeah, that's not happening. Well, I guess that drive's no good. Let's see if I get my disc back. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's broken. I wonder what's going on with the sound, though. Yeah, multimedia audio controller is gone. Let's try enabling. Well, I guess we just don't have the driver for it. Oh well. Now, let's check out that hard drive. Let's give that an old error check. This is not nearly as satisfying as scan disk. Oh, this. Sure. Okay, let's reboot. And looks like that drive is healthy. No bad sectors. Okay, let's try to burn a CD. Let's just try to burn this driver's folder, why not? Do it. Oh, is it actually burning? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it actually worked. So that drive is fully functional. Okay, let's see what's creeping behind this faceplate. Okay, well, it's not too bad. Just needs a quick dust busting.
Okay, that's good enough. And overall, the rest of the system is in really good condition. There's just a few little scrapes and dings on the side panels, but overall, not too bad. That fully functional, defect-free Western Digital Caviar was an especially nice touch. It was a bit surprising, because it's not exactly a coincidence that both of my sacrificial hard drives are Western Digital Caviars, and I certainly appreciate the functioning ZIP250 drive. Let's move on to the next system. And here's the second of the twins, named Laser2. We've got a lot of similarities here. In fact, the only differences are the CD burner and the gray accents, and that's a different model floppy drive. We also have the same set of badges down there. Now I'm curious how deep the similarities go. And I see somebody left a zip disk in there. Hopefully it's a ZIP250 disk because I don't have any of those. And here's a look at the back of the machine. And that looks like the exact same motherboard with the same SPDIF output. Video card looks different though. Got a composite output there. And the other one had S-Video. And no other peripheral cards in this one either. And I guess the first system was enough to satisfy the fan goblin's seemingly insatiable hunger. This machine still has its top case fan. Well, let's get this thing open. And hey, this one actually has a CPU fan. And that power supply looks kind of newy. It doesn't have a minus 5 volt rail. And luckily we have a hard drive there, though it's kind of haphazardly mounted. It's not actually in an adapter, it's just held in with two screws. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Don't know why they didn't just put it in one of the 3.5 inch drive bays. Looks like at some point there were hard drives down there. So who knows what was going on. And what on earth do we have here? It's running to the case fan header, but only has one wire. Oh, it must be some kind of extension for the top-mounted case fan. Well, that's kind of silly, though. It's only sending the tack signal to the motherboard. It's taking power from that Molex connector. So the motherboard wouldn't be able to control the speed of the fan. I guess they were just worried about monitoring the fan RPM. Why wouldn't they just extend all three leads? That's so strange. Okay, let's clear these cables out. Now let's check out that video card. That's an exercise in dexterity. Forgot about those. Now yeah, we've got an Asus branded ATI Radeon 7000 with no heatsink. So a slightly less capable version of the card that's in the previous system. And unlike the previous system, this board was not spared in the capacitor plague. Gonna have to see if I have replacements for those. If not, we may have to just roll with it. It's also weird that this board has the more annoying version of the AGP locking tab. This board is the exact same model and exact same revision as the last one. Guess they were just using what they had. Okay, let's get that hard drive out of there. And that's an 80 gig Western Digital Caviar. The manufacture date is June 21st, 2005. Let's hope it's healthy. Let's pull the rest of these drives. Okay, let's eject that zip disk, which of course requires power. And it's a 100 megabyte one. Oh well. And that disk is so dusty it barely ejected. And that's why we clean them. And that floppy drive is a Mitsumi D359T5. It's also a mess. Spindle sounds kind of awful. Well, at least it's not nearly as dirty as the last system's floppy drive. And that CD burner is made by LG, apparently harvested from a Compaq, manufactured July 1999. And that is the exact same model DVD burner as the last system, with the same manufacture date. They must have been pumping them out. Now let's check out that CPU. And that CPU is slightly better than the one in the previous system. This one's 2800 plus. Let's pull that out of there. Looking good under here. Let's get this chip cleaned up. Now let's see how that fan sounds. And it actually sounds perfectly fine. Good old AMD, using quality components. It does need to be cleaned up though. There we go, all clean. 
And unfortunately, I don't have replacements for those caps on hand, so we're just gonna have to roll with it. The system should still work fine like that, but we'll see. What's interesting is the motherboard in the last system had Nichicon caps there, so I gotta wonder which board is older. Did they realize these caps were crap or did they cheap out? I'd love to know. And I noticed something about these cases on the last system. It looks like this motherboard tray is removable. Of course on the last system I realized that after I had connected everything, but on this one I want to try to pull that thing out. It looks like we have a single screw back here. Now it looks like this just slides. It doesn't slide easily. Aha! It is removable. That's generally something I only ever see on AT cases. So that's cool. Hey, I'm starting to like these cases. Okay, let's get that CPU sorted out. And while this is a newer power supply from a reputable brand, I'm still gonna torture it. But first, let's crack it open and see what conditions are like inside. Which of course means stabbing that warranty sticker in the face. We are void. Not much length on that fan wire. And everything seems to be in order in here. Let's bring the heat to it. This could be the newest power supply I've ever tested on this channel. Let's see if it lets us down. Okay, it's doing just fine. It did take that fan a while to spin up though. Okay, five minutes later, still doing great. Finally, a good one. Okay, I've got everything reinstalled. I've got the same RAM that I used in the last system in there. Let's see what this thing does. And it posts. And the hard drive did sound healthy. All right, same deal with the clock speed. Save that. And Windows 7. I definitely wasn't expecting that to be on there. Guess they said screw Vista. Yeah, this thing has Windows 7 Pro on it. <laughs> I was not expecting that. I guess they had a thing for Norton Internet Security. Uh-oh, we're missing drivers. Okay, let's see what we have on here. Ah, uh, never mind. Gotta reboot. Okay, now let's see what we have on here. This is definitely the least retro OS I've found yet on these systems. We do have QuickBooks from 2014. Honestly, I can't believe it's running 7. And it's actually running fairly decently. For having 2 gigs of DDR1, single core processor, and a rust spinner. It's doing okay so far. Let's see what's on that hard drive. A little over half full. Though with what is unclear. Let's try to find the latest date stamp on this system. So far we're up to February 2015. The documents usually tell all. But we don't have any documents. So when that fails, we look at browser cache. And no browser cache either. Somebody was covering their tracks. I guess they didn't use Internet Explorer very much. <laughs> and it crashes immediately. Well, clearly we see why. It's just IE being IE. Go. Quit crashing. Ugh. Okay, so we know it was being used all the way up to 2015. That's still a pretty impressive lifespan for this system. Let's see when Norton says the last scan was. Uh-oh. Norton's broken. Last scan was 829-2014. Now trust level is 87. What makes this computer 13% untrustworthy? <laughs> okay, well, let's test these drives. Starting with the floppy drive. And it works. Now, how about the zip drive? I'm gonna use my own disk because the disk that was in there was pretty crusty. Okay, looks like that works. Yes, it does. Good old zip drives. Okay, but my curiosity is killing me. 
I have to at least try to see what's on the zip disk that was in there. Okay, apparently that's broken. Continue without scanning. Aha, there's some engraving stuff. So I think we finally have our answer. These machines were definitely being used for engraving. Possibly at some kind of trophy shop or something. Oh cool, we figured that out. Now let's move on to the optical drives. Dusty dusty. All right, looks like that drive works. Let's explore. And it does indeed. Those Pioneer drives are solid. Can we say the same for the CD burner? It's a little bit lazy. Yeah, I'd say that's a no. It does nothing. Let's just try a different disc. Yep, ain't got it. Oh well. So, how about the old hard drive? Let's do it. We probably have to reboot. Yep, of course we do. Schedule it. Okay, let's reboot. And looks like that drive is healthy too. Awesome. Well, two is better than one, I guess. Except, of course, when one has crepacitors in it. I'm dying to know what the deal is with that. But honestly, I'm pretty impressed with how this thing runs Windows 7. That little Athlon XP was getting it done. I sure wish I had more time this week, because I'd love to see how actual applications run on it. I'm also tempted to install Windows 10 and see how that runs. How far can the Athlon XP be pushed? Yeah, like it or not, these systems are becoming classics now. I don't know how to feel about it either. We'll just continue to preserve them and try not to look at the calendar too much. I think I need to go take some ibuprofen now. If you enjoyed this video, thank a patron for making them possible. If you really enjoyed this video, perhaps you'll consider becoming one yourself. That'll eventually allow me to make longer and more detailed videos and release them on time. One day. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.